Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Spotify for Podcasters has made our podcasting process so much easier and even has options like Q&As and polls so we can engage with listeners. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Join me, 48 Hours correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Erin Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, streaming January 25th, only on Netflix. The following contains descriptions of physical violence, sexual violence, and graphic descriptions of autopsies. Hey listeners, welcome to episode 62 of TGIC Podcast. I'm Izzy. And I'm Jillian. That was so uncomfortable. That was really weird. Okay. So, if you're new here, in our last... Well, we've just been switching it up this year a lot, I feel like, with a bunch of our different episodes. Yeah. But, um, so the last episode, Jillian took the lead on, and I listened and did commentary, and this one I'm taking the lead on. I don't think we're ever going to do this again. No. It's a pain in the ass. It's just, it's funny, because I feel like we balance each other out with the way that we research and the way that we talk, Mm -hmm. and having us, like, individually split it up... Is weird. Is weird. Like... Like, Izzy, for example, has taken so much time to research. And, like, it's come out with, like, a lot. She's got a lot of research. It's going to be a really good episode. However, it did take her forever. It took me a really long time. (laughs) And, like, I just, like, I feel like we balance each other out. And, like, in certain aspects of research, there's, like, places where I like to do it. Like, Mm -hmm. Izzy's, like, the timeline girly. Like, I, when I do a timeline, I can't do it as well as Izzy does it. I love a good timeline. It works better when we, like, balance each other out. Yeah, because it's, like, I feel like Jillian does... You're really good at making the information succinct and, like, not including things that are unnecessary. I'm the total opposite. Yeah. I'm fully the opposite. So That's good, though. You get the fun the fun details. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, we like to change it up a little bit. Yeah, so that's what we're doing. Um, and today, I'm going to be covering a really disturbing case that, honestly, I, I don't even know. I went down the rabbit hole with this one. I don't know why, but, like, the occasional case, I'll just cannot stop researching it because it's just so, like, fascinating, which I know is really morbid, but there was just something about this one that was just so fucked up. Hmm, fun. Yeah. So, today, I will be covering the disappearance of Susan Powell. Did I lock my car? All right, well, <laughs> brief intermission brief that intermission. I locked my car. Yeah, Jillian now locked her car. This is why I don't drive, guys. Yeah, I don't really drive that much any either anyway. You have a car, though. Yeah, I do have a car. This is my parents' car. I forgot to lock, but it's fine. It, it's fine. It's, it was like two minutes. Yeah. I fixed it. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the background. Um, so Susan Marie Powell was born on October 16th, 1981 in <laughs> Alamo, Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. What does that mean? Is that Spanish? Gordo is fat. Yeah, I don't know. So what is Alamo? I don't know. Isn't the Alamo, like, a thing? Yeah, it is, but I don't, like, Alamo Car Company. No, like, Alamo, isn't, like, the Alamo, yeah, like, a thing in Texas? Yeah, it is, but I don't know what Alamo Gordo means. Fat Texas? I don't know. Anyways. Sorry, I'm chatty today. Well, she was born there, but she grew up in Washington State. 
Susan went to cosmetology school and became certified and trained professionally, and her family has said that this was just because Susan just wanted to make others feel beautiful in their skin, and she wanted to accentuate everyone's natural beauty, and it was really her passion, and everyone just said it was her biggest trait, that she loved to feel beautiful and make others feel the same. Wow, it's so beautiful. Which is really beautiful, and I don't know, it's just one of those things that when you're researching and it really stands out to you about someone, like, it's just, it's something beyond, oh, her smile lit up a room. Yeah. Right? Like, she just always wanted to make other people feel beautiful. And her family practiced Mormonism, and her faith was really important to her. And because of this, she attended an Institute of Religion course at her Church of the Latter-day Saints when she was 18. Through the church, she went to a dinner party at one of the students' houses in her class in October of 2000. And the house belonged to Joshua Powell, and they immediately felt a connection. Joshua Powell had attended the University of Washington, and he graduated with a degree in business, and they met each other when he was still in college. So Josh and Susan immediately became infatuated with each other, and she was smitten with him. They fell head over heels in love with each other, and because of this, they were quickly engaged. Like, as in quickly, I mean, like, a matter of a month or two. Oh, shit. Yeah. Their wedding was in the Portland, Oregon Temple, and they were married in April of 2001. After Joshua and Susan's wedding, they lived with Joshua's father for a short period. I just literally had, like, <laughs> like, I literally, like, everything was rushing out. So, sorry. They lived with Joshua's father for a short period of time in Washington State so that they could get steady on their feet for a bit and decide what they wanted to do. And by 2004, the couple had moved to West Valley City, Utah, which is a suburb of Salt Lake City. And in their small community, they made friends and went to church where they created a tight-knit circle of friends, and they both stayed in contact with their parents throughout this entire thing. Additionally, when they moved, Joshua kind of bounced around jobs, but Susan got a full-time job as a broker at Wells Fargo Investments, and she was like known to be the breadwinner of the family. The seemingly happy couple welcomed their first child, Charles, in 2005, and their second son, Brayden, in 2007, and both of them attended a local preschool. So, getting onto the timeline, on December 6 of 2009, okay, this is a short segue, my mom remembers hearing about this case. That's kind of cool. When I was, like, little. Like, they followed it all throughout my childhood. Really? Yeah. Huh. That is interesting. That case for me is the Natalie Holloway case, because she, like, disappeared when, like, like, around when I was born yeah so when my parents were like still at the hospital with me they would watch the like the news was like the only thing on the tv so they oh just that's God. like like the big case they followed when I was younger yeah not only how have they solved that case yet I think it's like mostly solved mm, interesting so back to the timeline December 6 of 2009 but it began normally Susan and the boys attended church services and then later in the afternoon Susan's friend visited the family at their home Susan and her friend sat on the couch in the living room and chatted while knitting, and Joshua actually offered to make dinner for them. Susan's friend later reported that this was really weird, and, like, Joshua never did any of the housework or any of the cooking. Like, he was just not a very nurturing dude. Oh. Yeah, which is also interesting because he worked from home for a lot of the time. I know, but, like, the friend's being a little judgy on his, like, what if he wanted to try cooking? True. And... Yeah, so it, she just noted it as a little bit off-kilter. Like, it wasn't a normal thing. Okay. So Josh actually made his family and the friend pancakes and eggs for dinner. So, like, a little breakfast for dinner moment. And he actually called his father, Stephen, for the pancake recipe. And this is off-topic, but apparently he made the pancakes really weird. What do you mean? Like, he made each pancake one at a time instead of, like, putting multiple on the pan. And, like, as he finished a stack, he would give it, like... To one person at a time. That's not that weird. But, like... Would you really call that that weird? I don't know. Like, I just remember I watched, like, a documentary on this case, and they know... Like, they spent, like, ten minutes explaining this. I mean, I'm just thinking, like, when I make pancakes, I usually use one of those, like, I don't know what it's called, but, like, like the flat yeah. skillet pan, and I'll do, like, four at a time. But if mm-hmm. I was using just, like, one pan, I'd only do one pancake at a time. I know. I think they thought it was weird because they were making... He was making pancakes for five people. Oh. I don't know. Teach their own. Teach their own, yeah. Um, so he started by giving a plate to the friend, then his wife, and then he finally made plates for himself, and then each of the boys. 
I don't know why that was. Again, this is why I don't do all the research. <laughs> just, <laughs> Thank you for telling me the order in which the pancakes are served. You're welcome. This is literally doesn't make any sense for the rest of the kids. <laughs> You're so stuck on the pancakes. Yeah, I don't know why. So shortly after dinner, Susan fell asleep on the couch, and the family friend left the house to return home after being kind of ushered out by Joshua. And that was the last time that Susan Powell was ever seen. Oh, shit. So December 7th of 2009, the morning came and Joshua or Susan had failed to bring their sons to daycare without an explanation. And because of this, the workers at the daycare tried to get in touch with them. And after failing to reach either Josh or Susan, they called their assigned emergency contacts, who were Josh's mother, Terika, and his sister, Jennifer Graves. Um, in the meantime, Terika and Jennifer, like after getting this call, they went to the family's house to see why they had not brought the children to daycare. And once they got there, even though there had been fresh snow the previous night, there were no tire tracks coming out of the family's garage, which is weird. Like kind of showed that they hadn't left. And the lights were off in the house. And even after banging the door and the windows and getting no answer, they grew really worried. This part I find actually kind of weird because they said that their first thought when, like, nobody was answering the door and the car wasn't out of the, like, garage, they imme- they said that they both immediately thought that the family was dead inside of their house due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah, that's fucking weird. Which is really weird. Like, last week when Izzy was doing research in Spanish, she turns to me, like, mind you, the class is, like, mostly quiet, <laughs> and she turns to me and she goes, hey, Jillian... If I was, like, living alone and I hadn't come out of my house and there was no signs that my car had left and the lights were off and I was banging, you were banging on the door and, like, nobody was answering, what would your first thought be? (laughs) And I just, I had to think, I was like, well, first of all, it's a weird fucking question, but I was like, I feel like you just assume that they're, like, asleep or in the shower, Mm -hmm. right? That's, like, a normal... Yeah, that's what you would think. And additionally, I thought it was kind of weird because, like, the kids weren't, they were younger, like, mm-hmm. I feel like a family could easily decide, oh, we're going to take, like, not go to school today and, like... Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know. Like, if... Or they were sick or some. I don't know. I feel like that's relatively, like, not weird. Yeah, I don't know. I it's, wouldn't... They're missing preschool, not elementary school, middle school, Exactly, school. Like, like, it's preschool. Yeah. Um, and they called the police for a welfare check. The police arrived really quickly, and because there was no way to enter the house otherwise, they asked for permission to break a window, and that's what they ended up doing. Upon entering the house through the window, they discovered that there was, in fact, nobody home, and the minivan wasn't there that the family drove. Uh, Another weird thing was that there were multiple box fans in the living room, like, running, Hmm. and they were blowing onto a wet spot on the couch and the carpet. Okay, so maybe a kid, like, pissed themselves. Yeah, I don't know, but also remember, Susan was sleeping there the night before. Oh, maybe she pissed herself. (laughs) What? (laughs) You know, yeah, maybe... Well, what, why is that not a normal thing to think when you see a wet spot on the couch? No, you're actually really right. You want to just think really like weird? Like spilling a drink or something? My yeah. childhood dog, he used to lick the couch. And there used to be giant wet spots on the couch because he used to just sit there and lick the couch. <laughs> why? I don't know. No one ever really knows. He just used to lick the couch. Hmm. My dog, like, licks his paws. That's nice. I think he maybe he was <laughs> going for his paws, but it wasn't very bright, and so he just kept hitting the couch. I don't know. But oh there God. were wet spots frequently on my couch because he used to lick. Oh, poor buddy. I know. Um, and the, the police even, like, asked um, Terika and Jennifer, like, why do they have box fans? And they were like, I don't know. Like, it was just weird. Um, and other than that, there was not much out of place. Nothing was rummaged through or taken. And the only thing that struck Terika and Jennifer by surprise was that all of Susan's belongings were still in the house. Like, they found her purse and her wallet, but they didn't find her phone. Mm -hmm. And also, the family car was gone, like I said earlier, and the blankets were stripped off of the boys' beds. That's weird. Like, they weren't in the house, weren't in the washer, like, they were just not on the beds. Maybe they pissed themselves. I'm sorry. So, (laughs) without any leads, they waited around the area until they got a call. At about 5 p.m. that same day, Josh returned to the family's home with the boys, but Susan was nowhere to be found. Quickly, they took Josh to the police station to question him, and he was very evasive of their questions. He claimed that the previous night, he made a spur-of-the-moment decision to take the boys camping, and he left Susan at home because she was already asleep. Let me just say this before. Um, This immediately was seen alarming, 
because, I mean, there was a blizzard the night prior in Utah in December. Mm -hmm. And he said that he had taken the boys to Simpson Springs in western Utah for the night. And there was literally a blizzard. It was freezing. And also, who takes their, like, infant sons to go camping at, like, midnight? I know. Only a few hours before they were supposed to go to daycare. That's really weird. Like, that's so weird. And I mean, in a lot of the research I did, people were like, that wasn't really unlike Josh. But if Susan was there, she never would have let him do that. Like, he was just weird and did spontaneous stuff like that for no reason. Yeah. I don't know. But Josh asserted that, like, he hadn't called his job or the daycare out of, like, pure negligence because he thought that it was Sunday morning and not Monday morning. Maybe he was just being a silly goose. Yeah. I mean, maybe. (laughs) Maybe that's why. Um, And also, he, like, they put red flags. Oh, my God. These explanations put red flags up everywhere, especially since there was still no sign of Susan, and their family and friends did not think that she would ever leave the boys whom she cared about on her own free will, especially since the family only had one car. Like, where was she? He said that he had no idea where she was, Hmm. and, like, he left and left her sleeping on the couch, and then she was gone the next morning. Okay. Yeah. And that same day, they also the police also did a cursory search of the family's minivan where they found some camping supplies like graham crackers and blankets, which is where like where the boys' blankets were, and some tools. But they also found Susan's phone in the center console console. What year is it? Um, two thousand nine. Okay. So it's a flip phone. Well, yeah, I was just trying to think about how weird that would be, because like obviously now you find a phone in the center console and that's it's like weird. That's really fucking weird. But like she could have left it in the car. She could have left it in the car. Because they did go really... to church that morning, like, the morning prior. Yeah, and I I feel like then it was, like, different. your phone was not your lifeline. Like, yes, it was important, but it wasn't, like, like now if your phone was left in the center console, like, that would be, like, you'd freak out. Yeah, exactly. And when Josh was asked about this, he said that he just had no idea why her phone was in there. Um... And in the interview, kind of after dodging all of their questions, he said that he needed to get home to his boys. And he was, like, he left, and the detective, like, if you look at the tape of this first interview, the detective literally says something along the lines of, like, how are we going to find your wife if you're not helping us? Yeah. Like, how are we going to find her if you're not even telling us any information about her, where she would be, where you would find her? Like, I think the most, like, general thing he said he was like oh maybe she went to a craft craft store like she used to go to craft stores a lot that's what he was like but you wouldn't she would probably wouldn't be there (laughs) well yeah she probably doesn't go to a craft store for like 12 hours in the middle of the night (laughs) yeah i don't know and also how would she get there she didn't have the (laughs) car she walked in the blizzard for the whole day to the craft store yeah i don't i don't know and in the meantime the boys were actually questioned about the night prior and, I mean, they're little kids, so they were kind of cryptic. Little kids? And can I just comment on little kids for a second? You know what is so annoying? Talking what? to little kids. Yeah. Like, you know when they're, like, just starting to talk, but, like, they, they can't... Making up shit. They can't, like, form sentences. I say that as in, like, I can't form yeah, sentences. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, you know when they're just like, oh, my God, do you know this? Oh, oh, wait, oh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, they can't, they can't string sentences together. And it's just like, and then, and then, and then. And it's so fucking annoying. This is why yeah, I don't Imagine do interviewing children for That's your what job. I'm saying. That's what I was thinking about. That sounds terrible. Yeah. So the youngest son actually wouldn't, like, talk to the police. Obviously, he was kind of shaken. But Charles would. And he said a few disarming comments. First, he said that his mom had actually gone on the camping trip with him. But she didn't come back with them. Oh. Which is like, That's red flag, good. red flag. Especially since Josh was like, oh yeah, she didn't come. The other thing like, is, kids don't really lie. Yeah, like, why would he lie about that? Yeah. And then he also said, like, so the investigator, like, kind of pushed him as to where his mom was and, like, any information about it. And he said, quote, she is where the crystals are. Ew. That was a quote. Which is like. You, that was a quote. <laughs> that was a quote. <laughs> where the fuck are the crystals at? In mines. Mines. Like, in a mine. Oh. I don't... Mines scare me. Mines scare me, too. Especially abandoned ones. Yeah. Jeez, mine... This episode is hitting a lot of things I'm scared of. Carbon monoxide poisoning, mines. And much more. Yeah, there's there's apparently another fear of mine in this episode. There I is. Like, there better not be chloroform. Not that we know of. Okay, good. Yeah. Because chloroform would be up there, too. I'm, yeah. At least I'm scared of realistic things. I'm scared of a realistic thing. Like what? I'm scared that I'm going to be walking in public and someone is going to inject. 
<laughs> inject me with like a drug of some sort, like heroin or meth or something, and then I'm gonna be like coked on it for life. That is I'm not so realistic. I don't know, but like, like getting needled. That's my biggest fear. Getting needled. Okay. Yeah, but someone's just gonna come up to me and like. Okay. I won't make fun. I have a lot of. I clearly have a lot of fears. Yeah, that's like my biggest fear, though. Um. Anyways, so yeah. Um. And the following days after the initial disappearance, there was, like, huge widespread searches that took place in search for Susan. Her friends and family members and obviously the people in her church were putting out flyers everywhere, searching nearby areas and holding candlelit vigils for her. However, not surprisingly, Josh never attended any of these searches. He refused to talk to any press, and he essentially hid in his house with all of the, like, curtains drawn all this stuff. It's just, just like, and the there was one candlelit vigil in particular that he didn't go to, but he showed up like later on, like mm-hmm. when it ended That's with weird. his kids. It was really weird. And let me just tell you to keep in mind that before I tell you some of the other stuff that the police, like they couldn't arrest Joshua because it was a lot of circumstantial evidence. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why, like the DA didn't want them to arrest him. That makes sense. Which makes sense. So, on December 8th, Josh went to the airport and rented a car, which he reportedly drove over 800 miles before returning it back to the airport on December 10th. To this day, they have no idea what he did in those days. Oh. They never were able to figure it out? No. That's kind of weird. Yeah, it is really weird. And also, like, they literally... um, like, there, was, there are a bunch of videos of Josh emptying out their house, donating stuff, cleaning the car. Oh. Like, their minivan. Mm-hmm. All this, like, really crazy stuff. So, by December 9th, the police had begun their actual investigation into the disappearance of Susan, and they started by doing a really thorough search of the Powell residence after getting a search warrant. They discovered that there were traces of blood, Susan's blood, on the carpet and that Josh had thoroughly cleaned the family's home and minivan, like I just said, before it got um, searched through. Mm. Which is, like, that's so negligent on the police's part. Yeah. Honestly, like, there's probably so much evidence that got lost because of that. Mm -hmm. And even if it wasn't, like... Let's say that Josh was taken out of the equation. Him cleaning the house could have gotten rid of crucial evidence to find his wife's... Well, clearly he's trying to cover it up, Izzy. Yeah, I know. I know. You say that, he's like, why would he do that if he wants to help? (laughs) He's clearly trying to save his ass. Yeah, I know. (laughs) And they also discover that Josh had taken out a $1.5 million life insurance policy on on Susan... (laughs) On Susan before her death. Okay. $1.5 million... Yeah. Um, And by December 15th, the investigators discovered that Susan actually had a secret safety deposit box that she kept in the bank that she worked at. Mm -hmm. And in this box was a handwritten note that she had left that raised a lot of alarm bells. So here's a quote from it. I've been having extreme marital stress for three to four years now. How long have you been married for? Um, Since 2000. That's like half her marriage. (laughs) Yeah. For mine and my children's safety, I feel the need to have a paper trail. He has threatened to skip the country and told me if we were if we divorce, there will be lawyers. Yeah. A lot of divorces have lawyers. I mean, like, yeah. the first part, yeah, but, like, what, what does that mean? Like, if there's going to be a divorce, there's going to be lawyers. All divorces have lawyers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Girl, what? And the letter said that under no circumstances should Joshua Powell be allowed to see the letter, and then it, like, wasn't meant for him. Hmm. And, like, this, you should never see this, basically. So, this letter immediately prompted a deeper investigation into Josh Powell, and I'm just going to go into some information about him quickly. So, Joshua Powell was born on January 20th, 1976, to Stephen and Terrica Powell in Washington State. And his parents had kind of a notably dysfunctional marriage. It's been reported that this was because Stephen, who is his father, did not live by the teachings teachings of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Oh, I oh know. Yeah. And on his mother's divorce filings from his father, she noted that on multiple occasions, Stephen shared porn- pornography with his sons and refused to limit certain behaviors that were like deemed as like 
sinful, oh. basically. She also noted that Joshua had killed his sister's gerbils and often tortured animals and that he had supposedly threatened his mother with a butcher knife on oh. an occasion. Oh my god, wait. Yeah. No, this is not the same case. I There's a case... Not, it's slightly similar, but it was like, I can't, honestly, I barely remember the details, but it was like this husband and wife went to stay with the wife's family or something. The dude had been totally normal for many years, but then like he ended up killing all the people in that house. But then they like looked into him and when he was like a child, he like attacked his family and like killed his pregnant mom. What? And, but it like nobody knew about it because it was like sealed. It was sealed because he was like 12 or 13. And he never did anything until he killed all those people, including his wife. Isn't that fucked up? That's like so... That case. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so messed up. I know. Now I need to figure out what case that is. I'll have to look into it. I forget yeah. where I heard it. Woo. <laughs> Anyways, so like I said earlier, he was a student at the University of Washington, and he actually dated a girl named Catherine Terry Everett, who he met at the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Interesting enough. Mm. And they ended up quickly moving in with each other. But Catherine later reported that he was extremely possessive of her and had typical typical psycho crazy bitch behavior before she broke up with him over the phone when she was on a trip to Utah. Some weird parallels. Yeah. And she never moved back to Washington State. Like, she just, like, moved her stuff out of the apartment and moved to Utah. Smart. Yeah. Anyway, so just really inherently clear that Joshua Powell is extremely controlling, and it can be assumed that he's most likely, one, projecting his insecurity onto the women in his life, and two, acts like the, this as a result of his childhood and his father, Stephen. Not an excuse, just an Not explanation. an excuse, yes. Um, so throughout the, his marriage with Susan, like, some things shifted over time. When they first got together, they were really lovey-dovey with one another, and it was clear that they were in love. However, as time went on and the boys were born, there had been, like, a shift taking place. Susan was working more than Stephen, and she was also the more prominent breadwinner, as I said earlier. Yet she was mainly taking care of the boys and doing the housework, and Josh was just, like, no help. And he was, no, like, not a loving father, and it was clear that he was just not very connected to, like, the boys or to Susan anymore. Mm-hmm. And leading up to her disappearance, he was becoming distant from her, and he wouldn't really make any physical contact with her. Like, he wouldn't hold hands with her, he wouldn't hug her. Like, just kind of weird. Um, Another thing was that he took control of the finances, and he wouldn't let Susan spend any money without running it by him. But he spent thousands of dollars building a new computer system in their house, and Susan wasn't even really allowed to use it. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And because of just some mismanagement of their money, Josh ended up filing for bankruptcy in 2008. Individual people can file for bankruptcy? I think it, I don't know if it's like a, yeah, you can. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was like a business thing. Yeah. And there was like, it was like a lot of money that they were, yeah. But anyway, that could, it can be assumed that that probably caused some more marital stress. So, from, okay. I totally lost my place. Okay. Also, later on, um, Susan's closest friend alerted the police that Susan was thinking about filing for divorce from Josh and that she'd also recorded an entire video of their house documenting her personal assets. Mm. So, and they also found this video in the house. By this point, they'd also subpoenaed all footage and interviews that Josh had been in leading up to this and the documents from their house to be used in an investigation. By December 25th of 2009, he was officially named a person of interest in the investigation. What a suspect. Yeah, no, literally. (laughs) So from 2010 through 2012, on January 6th of 2010, he returned with his brother to their house, Michael, to pack up the family's belongings, and he indicated to the press and to the police that he was moving permanently to Puyallup, up wash Puyallup, up Okay. Pull up Anyways. Washington to live with his father. And... Here's where things get really convoluted. So things took a really messed up turn when claims by the fam- by the Powell's family friends indicated to police that Joshua might not be the only fucked up one. The family friends claimed that Stephen was obsessed with Susan and he was in love with her. Didn't we already know Stephen was fucked up? Yeah, but this is just even more like evidence mm-hmm. to pile on to. Um, just pile on. So, like I said, I was kind of talking about earlier how Susan and um, Josh 
and ended up living with his father, Stephen, in Washington for mm-hmm. a while, um, right after they got married. But they ended up moving to, oh, to Utah because of this. So they, the police searched the Powell home in Washington and found some things, including video footage, which was narrated by Stephen, and bagged belongings. The footage included videos of Stephen using a telephoto lens to videotape and take pictures of the underage girls who lived next door to him when they were in the bathroom, when they were in the shower, when they were changing. So yeah, he was just a really, really creepy dude. And Susan had told her friends and family about this. And they also found footage in the house of him putting a mirror under the door when she was in the bathroom, like when he was living with Ew. like when she was living with him. And when he when she was changing, like super, super creepy. It is super creepy. And there was also a voice recording found of him telling Susan that he was in love with her. And this recording was like they were in a car and like, Stephen had just left, the, or not Stephen, Josh had just left the car to go back into the house for something, and he was literally saying, like, I'm in love with you, and I want to be with you, and all this stuff, and she was, like, really grossed out by it. Yeah. And um, she, like, ended his advances, and she was like, no, I don't want this. Like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. And that was actually the reason that they moved to Utah in 2003. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and also... This is really gross, but he would actually bag, like, her underwear, her used underwear, and her tampons, and con swabs and stuff, and in, like, a voice recording, he literally said, like, I like to, like, smell it, and, like, put it on my, ew. ew, it's just really, really gross and really icky, and... Because of this, and by the because of the findings by the police, in November of 2011, Stephen was arrested and charged for child pornography. On the other hand, around the same time, Joshua underwent a series of court-ordered evaluations in Washington State because of his father's disturbing behavior. Mm-hmm. These raised issues concerning the ongoing criminal investigations and Joshua's failure to admit normal personal shortcomings and his overbearing behavior with his sons and his just, like, kind of defensiveness and, like, paranoia just was a red flag. He, they also noted that there was a presence of narcissistic traits in his evaluation, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the initial recommendation was for Joshua to have... or Well, his sons got taken away from him, and... They started living with Susan's parents, who would essentially act as, like, foster parents for the time being. And he was giving, like, visitation with his son several times a week, and these were supervised by a social worker. So, yeah. Um, And in the last week of January of 2012, Utah police discovered about 400 images of simulated child pornography, bestiality, and incest on a computer that was in the Powell home. Ooh. Yeah. So they discovered later that the pornography had been hidden by the previous owner of the computer because this computer was actually purchased by Susan secondhand. But the Utah authorities kind of used it to their advantage and, like, misled the court and accused Joshua of having viewed the images Uh and, like, getting pleasure out of them. And Okay, why would they even bother? Because I feel like there was enough to convict Joshua. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know why they did this. Why lie? Like, that kind of just makes it worse. Yeah. And I think they... I don't know if they lied, but they just kind of, like, like, manipulated the truth. I just feel like that was unnecessary. Yeah. And the images weren't really illegal... Because they were, like, literally cartoons. But, Ew, cartoon porn? Which is even grosser. And Ew. it was, like, apparently, like, known cartoons, like, children's cartoons. Ew! Yeah, really gross. And it was just a cause for concern. And this is also even worse because of, obviously, Joshua's father. And the fact that he, like, denied possessing any material that was kind of like this. Mm. The... Yeah. Um, Apparently he didn't really possess it. It was from the other guy. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know. It's just interesting. Um, but because of this, Joshua was recommended to receive a more thorough um, evaluation called a psychosexual evaluation. Ooh. Which is like, it includes a bunch of different things, including like a polygraph. But it also was like a, um, it was just weird. But 
Manley, who was like the main investor in the case, suggested no change in the visitation schedule with his sons. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me just explain a psychosexual evaluation really quick. It's basically a polygraph as well as other methods to determine if someone is a pedophile or has any inherently disarming psychological conditions regarding like sex and attraction and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it would make sense that Josh would be like really worried about this because it would be prodding him for information. And he was just like, obviously, he was very, he did not talk to the press, did not talk to the police. He was very evasive. So being hooked up to a polygraph was probably his biggest fear at this point. Yeah. Reluctantly, on February 5th of 2012, um, the social worker, Elizabeth Griffin Hall, actually took Charlie and Braden to a supervised visit at Joshua's house, Joshua's rented house in South Hill. And at this point, the boys were staying with their grandparents, and their grandparents said that it was going really well. And the boys were excited to see their dad. Like, they wa- they missed him, and they wanted to see him. Mm-hmm. This is where stuff takes a really horrible turn. Um, so the social worker, Elizabeth, claimed that once she got to the house... Josh grabbed the boys from her and pulled them into the house and locked the door so that she couldn't get in. Oh, shit. And that they couldn't get out. She called the police because she smelled gasoline, and Josh is obviously, like, in an investigation about his wife's disappearance. Yeah. But the police, like, if you listen to something, not normal called so infuriating because they're, like, they don't think it's an urgent situation. Oh. They're like, oh, we'll get someone there as soon as we can. But it, since it's not life or death, like... It is life or death. Yeah, exactly. It is. She and smelled she, gas and yeah, he's cray-cray. Exactly. And she was yelling on the phone. She was like, it is life or death. Like, those are his sons. They lock, like, he's under investigation for the disappearance of his wife. Like, this is life or death. Uh-huh. However, moments later, Josh sent a note to his attorney that said, I'm sorry, goodbye. And he doused the house in gasoline and lit it on fire. Ugh, and house fires are another big fear of mine. Yeah, so the patrol cars didn't get there fast enough, and out of nowhere, the house just literally exploded into flames. That's horrifying. The blast killed Josh, and it was what was deemed the final cause of death for the boys. However, it was also discovered that Josh had struck them both with an axe multiple times before laying them down next to each other, and he thought that this was what killed them, but it was determined later that they had actually been alive Oh! when the fire destroyed the house That's and awful. killed Josh. Yeah, so this is where that case kind of ends. They literally have no idea what happened to Susan to this day. Obviously, it can be kind of... You know, but yeah, so it's, wait, so you just never find out where no. she is? They've never found her, and actually, they didn't like, go to like check the mines or anything. So that's an interesting point because, so of course, Josh and Susan had some family friends who said that Josh literally said one time that the best place to hide a dead body would be in abandoned mines. Yeah, and so, the kid was like, where the crystals are? No, literally, and they know that he went camping down there. So they've looked in, like, all these mines, but there are so many abandoned mine systems yeah. in Utah that, like, they couldn't find her, and they've never... Like, there have been different instances of remains being found in, like, the mines in Utah, but none of them have ever been proven to be hmm. Susan's. Um, also, we still don't know what he did on that drive, on the 800-mile... So, like, you never know. What if he, like, picked her body up and moved her somewhere Re- else, Yeah, too? relocated, Yeah, yeah. Um, so Stephen, who was Josh's father, was convicted of voyeurism charges in May of 2012 in a trial which largely kind of went around the issues of Susan's case, mm-hmm. and he ended up dying of natural causes after leaving jail. Records also showed that Joshua had withdrawn $7,000 from his bank account and had donated all of his children's toys and books to local charities the day before the explosion, which is just weird. It's so weird when people fucked up people do fucked up things, but then they also like donate, donate. Oh my what? Yeah, what the fuck? Um, and Joshua's brother Michael was the beneficiary to his life insurance policy, but Michael actually killed him, sh- killed himself shortly after Josh's death. I mean, by jumping off a building. I mean, yeah. His. Do you hear about his family? Yeah, and also a lot of people think like have like. 
kind of said, oh, maybe Michael was involved somehow. Oh, really? This, yeah. This whole family is just all the Powells or the, yeah, I don't know, just so convoluted and so messed up. However, some light to the case is that in July of 2020, Washington State actually awarded Susan's parents with $98 million for negligence wow. stemming from the deaths of their grandchildren. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, but they fought really hard for that. And it's just like, this whole case is so sad. Like, you still don't really have that closure. And there are a lot of elements to this case that, like, I didn't even have time to go into. Wow. But yeah. This was the case in the disturbing disappearance of Susan Powell and the death of the Powell boys. Tune in again next, or eventually, eventually, <laughs> and follow us on Instagram at tgic.podcast. Bye! Bye.